of a Roman soldier because the servant is about to die. The second one is in a nearby town, Jesus encounters a funeral processional. Uh, a man has died who is the only son of a widow. And in each of those incidents, Jesus displays his power by performing a miracle. Now we know that happened 2,000 years ago, but my question for each of you this morning is simply this, is that same power available today? And if so, how do we experience it? That's why our message today is entitled Prayer, Power, and Authority. There is a sermon outline in your bulletin if you want to take that out, follow along and take notes. It's also on the church app. Mike Evans is director of Wholeness Ministries, uh, which is a prayer ministry here in Bakersfield. He's also an author. Uh, he's written this book, Learning to, New, to Do What Jesus Did. Uh, it's a book on how to pray for physical, emotional, and spiritual healing. Um, and in, in this book, uh, he explains the difference between power and authority. And he does so by, by using this illustration. He says, imagine you go to law school, you graduate, and you receive a diploma. At that point, you have the, the power or the ability to practice as an attorney, as a lawyer. But, but you cannot really practice as a lawyer until you pass the bar exam. Once you pass the bar exam, then you have the authority to be an attorney, to be a lawyer. So authority is the, the freedom and the right to act and exercise that power. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at Luke chapter 9, where Jesus calls his 12 disciples together. And he gives them power and authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal the sick. And he sends them out, and they do that because they had been given Jesus' power and authority. This week, Annette showed me in, in Luke chapter 10, when Jesus sent out the 72 to do this, those very same ministries of teaching and healing and casting out evil spirits, um, the 72 returned. They're excited about what has just happened. And some of you may remember, they returned and they said, listen, even the spirits submit to us in your name. And then Jesus responds by saying, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome the power of the enemy. They were able to do that ministry, to do miracles of, of healing people, casting out spirits, proclaiming the kingdom of God, simply because Jesus gave each of them his power and authority to use that power. Now, anytime you study scripture, uh, it's always wise to, to look at a scripture passage in context so you understand how best to, to uh, interpret it and, and apply it to our lives. Before we jump into Luke chapter 7, um, I want us to, to pause for a moment and look first at uh, chapter 6 in Luke uh, to see what preceded the miracles that then occurred in chapter 7. Uh, last week, Pastor Roger gave a good explanation of the conflict that Jesus and his disciples faced uh, when they violated some of the Sabbath tradi traditions and the religious leaders got so upset. The disciples were, were you know, eating grain on the Sabbath and they considered that wrong because they were harvesting food. Jesus ends up healing a man on the Sabbath and they're upset that Jesus is quote-unquote working on the Sabbath. But look what happens right after uh, those incidents. Uh, turn in your Bible. You can either uh, use your own Bible or take one of the blue Bibles that are in front of the uh, in front of you and the rack in front of you. Uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 6. Look at verse 12. This is after the conflicts on the Sabbath. It says, in verse 12, it says, one of those Jesus, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. This fall, as we have begun going through the Gospel of Luke, we have already seen that prayer is, 
uh, is a constant practice for Jesus. It's a key to any supernatural ministry that he's able to do, any miracles he's able to perform often are a result of him spending time in prayer. We've already seen in Luke's gospel that Jesus would get up early in the morning and he would pray silently by himself before he would engage in ministry. We saw in Luke chapter 4 where Jesus spent 40 days fasting and praying prior to him going out into the wilderness and being tempted by Satan. And here in chapter 6, we see Jesus spending the entire night in prayer before he calls his followers together and selects 12 of them to be his closest disciples. The names of those disciples are then listed in verses 14 to 16. And Jesus comes down off of the mountain. He ends up meeting a crowd that's waiting to to hear him, uh, waiting to hear him teach as well as they've, they've come looking for Jesus to heal their sick. And we read about that crowd in verse 18. Talking about the crowd, says, who had come to hear him and be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Because Jesus had spent that night in prayer, God's power flowed through him to heal the sick and cast out spirits. And then Jesus then begins teaching the crowd, and and we end up getting, in in Luke chapter 6, we get uh, Luke's version, sort of a a shortened version of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And, And that's recorded for us from verse 20 to the end of the chapter. And then we finally arrive at Luke chapter 7. Look with me, let's read about the the first miracle. Follow along as I read the first 10 verses in Luke 7. It says, When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. Oh, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house of the, when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found faith, found such great faith, even in Israel. Then the men, who, the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. In this short story of simply 10 verses, we see lessons of faith, humility, authority, power, and prayer. A key figure in the story is a centurion, which is a Roman soldier, which is interesting because history tells us there were really no Roman military forces in the region of Galilee, which is northern Israel. Rome didn't send groups of soldiers to Galilee until the the year A.D. 44. And yet here's a Roman centurion in Galilee. Most likely he may have been sent there and assigned to guard the Roman king, king of Herod, of Galilee, which would have been Herod. And this centurion's servant is close to death, so sick that, that he's not even able, to, the soldier's not able to bring his servant to Jesus. Um, Jesus enters the town of, of Capernaum. Um, you may remember 
Capernaum is a city where Jesus has already had a very successful ministry of teaching and healing, casting out spirits. We read about that in, in Luke chapter 4. Um, so the centurion hears that, that Jesus is in town. He knows of his reputation. Um, but then he decides to send Jewish elders to ask Jesus to come and pray for his servant. So who are these elders? Most likely, these elders were leaders of the local community, probably carrying out different responsibilities in, in the synagogue there in the city. You have to realize it was illegal for Jews to enter into the home of a Gentile because that would, that would be considered unclean and they wouldn't be able then to go to the, the temple. Um, and because of that, Jesus needs good reasons why he should enter the home of a Gentile and he needs to hear it from people he respects. And these Jewish elders, they show up, they speak very highly of this Roman soldier. They say, listen, even though he's a Roman soldier, a centurion, he loves our country. He even helped build our local synagogue, which history tells us was highly unusual. Sometimes, you know, foreigners would, would help, you know, contribute toward the building of a synagogue, but apparently this man had contributed most of the money, most of the construction cost. Um, and so Jesus is persuaded. He says, listen, I'll come. I'm willing to go to the, the home of a Roman centurion. And before he arrives, prior to him arriving at the man's home, he's greeted by friends from the soldier. They say, we've come with a message from the centurion. And the Roman soldier says this. He says, I'm not worthy to even speak to you or have you come into my home. Therefore, just say the, if you just say the word where you are, my servant will be healed. Because I understand authority. I have soldiers around me and I speak to them and they do whatever I say. He has servants that do whatever he says. The implication is the soldier is, is passing on the message saying, Jesus, I know that you are the, under the authority of God. And when you speak, God moves. So if you just say the word, I know that will happen. Obviously, the soldier was familiar with Jesus because Jesus could speak a word and cast out evil spirits. Maybe this soldier was familiar with some of the Old Testament scriptures. Maybe he was familiar with, with Psalm 107, which in there talks about God and says, uh, God sent out his world, word and healed them. Um, so Jesus hears this message. And he's amazed. He stops. He turns around at the crowd that's with him. He says, this is amazing. I have never seen such faith in all of Israel. Which is really a, a critique of his own Jewish people and their faith in God, the chosen people of God. And yet the greatest example of faith that Jesus sees as he's traveled all over Israel comes from a foreign Roman soldier, you know. But he had a heart of faith. And so these, these messengers, these friends of the Roman soldier, the centurion, they turn around, they head home. Once they arrive home, they realize the servant has been healed. God was faithful, and Jesus just spoke the word, and it occurred. Well, not wanting to be the center of attention, Jesus Moves on to a nearby town. We read about that starting in verse 11. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain. And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As, as he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out. The only son of his mother. And she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her and said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the beer. I had to look, to look that up. The beer, in ancient times, was a platform on which a coffin would rest. Okay? So he touch, touches the beer that they were carrying on. And the bearer stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praise God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. 
God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding countryside. So Jesus leaves the town of Capernaum. He goes, walks to a small town of Nain, which is some six miles from the town of Nazareth. When he arrives there, he arrives at the town gate and he discovers there is a funeral processional going on. Um, at that time, burials would always uh, occur out of town and they would, burials would occur uh, immediately after someone had, had passed away as soon as possible. Jesus sees what's going on, sees a huge crowd of people following this, finds out that uh, this is the only son of a woman who is a widow. We're told that his heart goes out to him. Jesus shows compa compassion. He stops the processional, looks at the mother and says, don't cry. And then he commands the young boy who has died to sit up, to get up. And the man sits up and begins talking. And he gives him back to his mother. You know, the, the crowd sees all that. And I'm sure that that miracle triggers memory of, memories of Elijah and Elisha uh, from the Old Testament. Each of them prayed and people came back to life. And now they've seen it right here. And the crowd sitting there is in awe, praising God and says, well, a prophet has appeared among us. God is visiting us to help us. God is doing something new in our land. And they were excited about that. Jesus' reputation had probably preceded him. But when you look at those two instances, and incidents here in, in Luke chapter 7, as we think about it, applying what we see to our lives, we're reminded that prayer is the starting point when you and I are seeking spiritual power. Praying in the name of Jesus based on the blood shed uh, on the cross of Calvary, that is what allows us to pray with spiritual authority. That authority is still available today. That authority to exercise God's power, God still desires to display through his church. We also know that prayer is a dominant theme in every one of the letters that Paul wrote to churches as well as to individuals. And a good example of a prayer like that is part of the prayer that Shara read earlier from Ephesians 1. And I want you to turn with me to Ephesians 1. We're going to spend the rest of our time looking at that prayer and applying it to our life because uh, there's some great principles that you and I can, can apply and things we can learn. Some of you may remember when we went through uh, the study on the book of Ephesians, this letter, uh, it's sort of strange but, but interesting that Paul had never met the people who received this letter. Even though he spent three years in Ephesus and, and it was a powerful ministry, when he wrote this letter, he personally did not know the, the people to whom the letter uh, was going to be sent. Let me show you. Look with me at verses 15 and 16. It says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So he had simply heard about their faith. Uh, scholars think that this, the, Paul wrote this letter of Ephesians, and it really went to a region uh, in what we consider uh, Turkey today. It was known as Asia Minor 2,000 years ago, and this letter was a circular letter that went from, from one church to another, because you know, there's, there's no personal names in here, like there are, are in a lot of his other letters. It's just sort of a general letter that is written to maybe half a dozen churches, uh, and scholars think that the, the letter ended up you know, the last church it went to was in the city of Ephesus, and it stayed there. In history, scholars think that this became known as the letter to the Ephesians, because that's where it ended up being resided. So Paul's writing to you know, a number of people, many who didn't, he did not know. So he says that, even though I've, I've heard about your faith, I keep praying for you, I keep giving thanks for you, you know. But then look, look what Paul prays for next in verse 17. 
I like this. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. We often say Christianity is not a faith of religious rituals. It's not a faith where we're mainly concerned about do's and don'ts and following different laws, things like that. Christianity is primarily a relationship with the God who created us. And Paul implies this in his prayer in verse 17 when he says he prays that they would know God better. And that the Greek word uh, know is part of the Hebrew concept. What, what it really means to, for, to know God better means to personally experience God, to experience God in your personal life. That's really what Paul is praying for. Uh, that God is real and active in your daily, uh, daily affairs. So how do we come to know God better today? Paul gives us a clue in this verse. He prays that they would know God, God better through a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Let me try to explain that. Anything that you and I know about God, he has re already revealed that to us. He's revealed that to us primarily through his word, through the Bible. But he's revealed it to us through creation. He's revealed it to us through his son, Jesus. He's revealing himself to people around the world today through visions and dreams um, in, in amazing, miraculous ways. Um, but, you know, uh, so, so we know God through his revelation. Um, and then Paul prays that they, as well as us, would know God better through wisdom and revelation. God's clearest revelation uh, to us of himself is through his word, through the Bible. And here's the point. As we spend time reading the Bible and we pray for wisdom, we pray for wisdom to know how to apply this in our life. As we combine his revelation his wisdom to help us understand, interpret, and apply, then we get to know God better. That's what Paul's praying for in verse you know, 17. But if you look at the rest of his prayer, I want to tell you, Paul is just getting warmed up in his prayer. Because look, look at what uh, he says in the very uh, next verse. Um, verse 18. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Now think about that image. I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. What is he praying for? He's praying that they would experience uh, new spiritual truths. And specifically, he's praying that they would know three things. I want you to notice the three things he prays for. Verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. Think about that. The hope to which he has called you, that refers to the future. That's the first thing. Secondly, pray that they would know the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. When do you receive an inheritance? That's also in the future. He wants them to look forward to the inheritance he's going to, they're going to receive as the people of God. And then the third thing, verse 19, says, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. And that deals with the present. So he wants them to know the hope of their calling, wants them to know the glorious inheritance they're going to receive. But he also wants them to know the incomparably great power for people who believe, and that's present. He wants them to, to be people who walk in the power of God. And what type of power is he describing? Well, look at the rest of verse 19 and, and 20. He says, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. The same power, think, think about it, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That's what God wants us to experience today. 
in our present age, as, as, you know, in daily living, as well as in the age to come. I don't even know what that means, about the age to come, but I know what it means to experience it now. Now, I want to, I want to admit, this may be a new concept for you. I mean, to hear about, you know, God wants you to, you know, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, God wants you to experience in your daily living. That may be a new concept for some of you. That may be a little wild for some of you, okay? Uh, don't, don't worry, I understand. But I really like what A.W. Tozer said in one of his writings. Uh, he said this, the Holy Spirit is not the cause of fanaticism. The Spirit is the cure for fanaticism, you know? Um, and when we talk about experiencing the power of God in our daily lives, you know what? We're simply talking about living by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit is God himself living in, the, in our lives and his power being expressed through our lives. The greatest spiritual miracle you and I can witness is when we see someone come to faith in Christ. When we see someone who's actually born again, they are spiritually reborn. That's the greatest miracle. But think about other teachings related to the Holy Spirit. Think of the fruit of the Spirit as is as is taught and described in Galatians 5. Let me give you an example. When you pray, when you pray to love a person who has hurt you, when you pray to have joy in the midst of difficulties, when you pray to experience peace as you are trying to resolve conflict, you know what you're doing? You're praying for the power of God in your relationships. That's what it means to experience the power of God. That's where the fruit of the Spirit. Think about, the, think about gifts of the Spirit. The Bible says that God gives a spiritual gift to every believer in Jesus Christ. And he does that, he explains in 1 Corinthians 12, so that the entire body of Christ, the entire church, would be built up. So what that means, if you're a Christian, you have a spiritual gift. If you have a gift, you have a ministry. The Bible says, if that's the case, all of us are ministers. I didn't say that. God says that. If you have a gift, you have a ministry. Welcome, fellow ministers. Okay? What that means, God has created you to serve in ministry. He shaped you to serve. And here, here's the thing that's important. Studies have shown that the Christian life is most fulfilling when Christians discover their gift and are using it in ministry. Um, but here, you know, if you don't know your gift, if you aren't serving in ministry, there is, you are missing out on some of the joy of, of the Christian life. Because you were designed to serve others. And there is joy in that because it's God's power through you giving you the desire, the motivation, and ability to serve him. And if you don't know that, then you're robbing yourself of that. See, when you, see, when you begin to see the power of God and people coming to faith, uh, when you see it, when you see the power of God transforming your own personal character, um, when you see the power of God using you to be involved in ministry, listen, your faith will grow. You will gain confidence to trust God for even the miraculous. Um, and we've seen that time and time again. And I want to tell you, that is God's plan for the church. Look at the last two verses of Ephesians 1. We'll close with this. Continuing to talk about Jesus, verses 22 and 23 says, And God placed all things under his feet, under Jesus' feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The church is God's fullness of Christ to the world today. Listen, God wants to display his power, and he wants to display it through the church. Folks, that, that's you and me. You and I are the church. God wants to display his power 
through you and me so that people would see God's power and want to come to him. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that we have the privilege to be part of your body, the body of Christ, the church. We recognize that you are the head, and from you come all power and authority to display your power, to reflect your character, to expose your nature to the world around us that is looking for love and purpose and meaning, but can only be found through Jesus Christ. We thank you for that. May we be, uh, as members of your body, open to what you want to do through us and be willing to display your power. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As you uh, stand for a final song, uh, go ahead, pass your cards to the center aisle. JR uh, is all ready to collect all of them. Uh, let's sing together before our final benediction. <laughs>